that your hand be with me. Comes from First Chronicles 4, 9 through 10. We've been there a couple of weeks. It's this two-verse passage of Scripture that just jumps out at us in a genealogy. It's a Jewish genealogy, a Jewish group of names, and all of a sudden there are two verses that come out and talk about a man we've never met before in Scripture and we never hear from again. But these, these uh, verses are important, and he's included in Scripture because of this amazing prayer that he prays. And it's one that as we've been talking about as a congregation, um, just how do you know doors that you should go through in your life? And how do you know if it's open or closed? And, you know, does God want us to go through open doors or just kind of stay where we're at? Anyway, it's, it's within that whole context I share these messages. And it says this. It says the guy's name was Jabez, and he was more honorable than his brother. So we, we don't know anything about his brothers. We don't know anything about Jabez up to this point, except that he evidently has very good character. And Hebrew, the Hebrew meaning of Jabez means pain. It means one who causes pain. So this next verse is kind of interesting because his mother, when he was born, calls him pain or he will cause pain. She says, because I bore him in pain. So therefore, I'm going to label him from the time that he takes a first breath as pain. So the first week of this series, we talked about labels and how difficult they can be to overcome, especially when we believe them. Everybody puts labels on people. You have labels. I have labels. It's one thing for them to be put on us. It's another thing for those labels to get right up here in our head to where we start to view life as having a label on us. So Jabez, I mean, you can't help it. If your name, if you're labeled pain, you can't help if mom calls you pain. You, you can't help but to kind of wonder if that's true, and I think that he went through his life feeling that, like, I may be a real pain, and I may be one who just ultimately causes people pain. However, here's the interesting part, is that even though he has a label that he probably believes, he still feels that there is a God who still cares about him anyway. And there is a God who you can pray big prayers to. He believes that even though he is one who may cause pain, that somehow God wants to still open doors for him in his life. So here's how his prayer goes. And Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you'd bless me indeed. God, would you bless me a big pain? Would you bless me, even though I'm, my mom said that I will, I'm one who causes pain, I caused her pain, but would you still bless me? And we've went over this a few times, so, but let me just say it again. It is evidently okay to pray for God to bless us in our life. It's really okay. It seems presumptuous. It seems arrogant. But it is okay in the right attitude to say, God, bless me, bless me, God. And he goes on and he says, this is perhaps even more bold. And we talked about this last week. And he says, God, would you please enlarge my territory? And I don't know exactly what that meant for Jabez living back then. I, I assume it meant more land. Uh, if he was a farmer, it meant more crops. You know, if he had animals, it meant more animals. God, give me more land. Give me more crops. Give me more animals. And again, this is the prayer, the type of prayer that you and I are like praying like this because we're afraid to be struck down. It's like, can you really say, God, bless me and God, I want more? Well, 
with the right attitude, you can because, because this is a prayer that God actually likes with the right attitude. In fact, I'll, I'll just refer, refer back to Abraham, who we've talked about a few times in this series. When in uh, Genesis 12, God approaches Abraham and he says to Abraham, Abe, I'm going to give you more. I'm going to bless you. I want to bless you. In fact, I'm even going to make your name great, Abraham, and I'm going to give you generation after generation after generation of people that will form a great nation, and it'll all start with you. I am going to bless you, and I am going to make your territory large, really large. But then God adds this at the very end of that. Why am I doing this, Abraham? So that you will take the blessings that I give you and you will bless others. Abraham, I am not interested in blessing you and I'm not interested in just giving you more so that you can become wealthy and rich and famous and just kind of live off to yourself and hoard it all. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your territory of influence larger so that you can in turn use that to do more and more good things in my name. I'm all for that, God says. So this is the kind of attitude that Jabez is praying, evidently. And then he says, the third part of his prayer says, and God, I, I need so much for your hand to be with me. Now, we pray that kind of prayer in, in some ways a lot. When we go, when we have a doctor's visit, and we go to the doctor, we say, oh, God, would you be with me? Would your hand be with me, be with the doctors? God, I've prayed that many times. Prayed it for people, other people, many times. Or when we go on a long trip, we say, oh, God, would your hand be with us? God, would you give us safety for this trip? We pray that kind of prayer a lot. And that's okay, but this prayer and the way that Jabez is using it is a lot bigger than the way I just said. It's a lot bigger, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. Now, now this, is, this is the last part of this prayer, and it says, And that you would keep me from evil, so that I may not cause pain. This is kind of pitiful. Because the guy feels like he's a pain. Mom told me I'm a pain. But even though, God, the odds are stacked up against me, I was born a pain. Even though that's the case, which wasn't the case, but even though that's the way he felt, God, would you help me to not cause people pain? Would you keep me from evil? And here's the interesting part, because had this next part not been added onto this, I would look at this according to kind of the way I sort of grew up and believed. And I would say, God will not honor any part of this prayer because it just seems too presumptuous and arrogant. But here's how it ends. So God granted what he requested. God grants a prayer that starts off with, bless me, O God. Bless me this day. And God answers a prayer that continues with, God, give me more. Remember now, remember the, the way that I said that it was the context that I believe you prayed it in. But God, enlarge my territory. God, would your hand be with me? So God grants this request that your hand be with me me. This is a, a story taken from the book um, entitled The Prayer of Jabez, Breaking Through to the Blessed Life by Bruce Wilkinson. And he writes, one day when our kids were preschoolers, my wife Darlene and I found ourselves with them at a large city park in Southern California. It was the kind of park that makes grown men wish he was a kid again. 
It had swings and monkey bars and seesaws, but what was the most enticing were the slides, not just one slide, but three, from small to medium to enormous. Now, David, who was five at the time, took off like a shot for the small slide. Why don't you go down with him, Darlene suggested, but I had another idea. Let's wait and see what happens, I said. So we relaxed on a nearby bench and watched. David clambered happily to the top of the smallest slide, and he waved over at us with a big smile, and then he whizzed down. Without hesitation, he moved over to the medium-sized slide. He had climbed halfway up the ladder when he turned and looked at me, and I looked away. He pondered his options for a moment, then carefully backed down one step at a time. Honey, you ought to go help him out, my wife said. Not yet, I replied, hoping the twinkle in my eye would reassure her that I wasn't just being careless. David spent a few minutes at the bottom of the middle slide watching the other kids climb up and whiz down and run around to do it again. Finally, his little mind was made up. He could do it. He climbed up and he slid down three times, in fact, without even looking at us. And then we watched him turn and head toward the highest slide. Now Darlene was getting anxious. Bruce, I don't think he should do that by himself, do you? No, I replied as calmly as possible, but I don't think he will. Let's see what he does. When David reached the bottom of the giant slide, he turned and called out, Daddy! But I glanced away again pretending I couldn't hear him. He peered through the ladder. In his young imagination, it must have reached to the clouds. He watched a teenage boy go hurtling down the slide. Then, against all odds, he decided to try. Step by step, hand over hand, he inched up the ladder. He hadn't reached a third of the way when he froze. Now, by this time, the teenager was coming up behind him and yelled at him to get going, but David couldn't, couldn't go up or down. He had reached the point of certain failure, and I rushed over. Are you okay, son? I asked from the bottom of the ladder. He looked down at me, shaken but clinging to that ladder with steely determination, and I could tell he had a question ready. Dad? Will you come down the slide with me, he asked. The teenager was losing patience, but I wasn't about to let the moment go by. Why, son, I asked, peering into his little face. Because I can't do it without you, Dad, he said, trembling. It's too big for me. And I stretched as high as I could to reach him and lifted him into my arms, and then we climbed that long ladder to the clouds together, and at the top I put my son between my legs and wrapped my arms around him, and then we went zipping down the slide together, laughing all the way. Oh, God bless me. God, increase my territory because I want to use those blessings that you give me, God, to just touch others' lives with. And when God increases your territory, when God puts you up on the big slide, Expect to feel overwhelmed. Expect to freeze for a moment. You can't go up or down. Can't do this. Uh, why would that be? 
because God's territories are God-sized. We have this thing as human beings that we only pray for people-sized territories, which can be big also. But we pray for territories that somehow will still help us to feel safe just in case it doesn't work out. So we stay on the medium slide and Ten years later, we're on the medium slide, and we're doing tricks on the medium slide. And I feel like it's 10, 15 years later, we're still on the medium slide, and we're, like, doing flips and stuff. And, oh, this is so great. And look at me. And but if we pray, God bless me because I want to use my life in a bigger way, then that means that he's going to put us in God-sized territories. Territories such that if God doesn't show up, we fail. If God doesn't show up, we look like a... Ooh. I mean, those two words in and of themselves are enough to make me not want to try it. Because I don't like to feel like a failure. And I don't want to ever have loser attached to my name. So that middle slide seems a whole lot better to just stay there the rest of my life. God bless me if we pray that prayer and then we pray God Make my territory larger so that I can bless others. Then here's the thing. We will find ourselves in desperation where we will either turn back or pray. We'll either say, just get me back to that middle slide. I'll find a way to get back down and get back into safe territory. Or we will say, God, this is so big that I have no other choice but to trust you fully. And so in desperation, we'll either turn back and keep playing it safe for the rest of our life, or we will pray. You know what kind of prayer? We'll pray something like, God, May your hand be with me, like Jabez did. May your hand be with me, because if your hand is not with me in a God-sized territory, I'll never make it. Daddy, I can't do this alone. I've been unpacking uh, my story. Listen, it's not just my story, it's Denise's story, because she lived, lived every moment with me through it been packing it a little bit each week. The 17 months that led me uh, before I came here at this church, this, the, the first six months in complete uh, burnout and depression and going through uh, counseling and getting help. Because I was just, I was so tired. I couldn't work. I had, I was just too exhausted. On November 5th, 2012, a minister who I knew of but didn't really know very well called me up one day and said, let's have lunch together someday. I said, great, I'm always up for that. Um, Insert joke here, but I, <laughs> um, and we began to look at our schedules, and our schedules were super full, which again was partly why I burn out. But schedules were very full, so full that neither one of us could agree on uh, 
a time when we could meet for lunch until January 7th. So from November 5 to January 7th. January 7th, we said, okay, on not lunch, actually, it was morning. Let's meet for breakfast at Bob Evans in Indianapolis on January 7th. Great. Write that down. Little did I know that I was, by that time, super close to burning out on November 5. And uh, various things happened that then put me into full burnout mode. And on December 2nd, 2012, I resigned my church over, I'd been there for over 20 years. I resigned so that I could heal up. I mean, people, um, ministers, like we're saying, you're going to kill yourself. You, I can't believe you don't have a heart attack by now. You've got to do something. And so on December 2nd, I resigned. And that left me with a part-time job driving a school bus. But I had a full-time um, uh, bills. I had full-time bills. And uh, my wife at that time was working part-time. But I'm too tired and too exhausted, and I needed healing. And I really couldn't, I just didn't have the energy even really to take on a second job. But my church, out of uh, love for me, that, I, that church that I resigned, incredibly said, Pastor, we want you to be able to heal up, and we are going to pay your salary for six months. After, you know, you've resigned on the second, we're going to pay you for six months so that you don't have to worry about getting a second job and you can, you can heal up. Well, when I left, um, unfortunately, the, the attendance of the church really bottomed out bad and just really went down really bad. And five weeks into getting this weekly check from my former church, I get a, I get a phone call from leaders that said, we want to meet with you on um, Monday night. It was a Monday night. They said, we need to meet with you. So they met with me, and they said, we are so sorry. I had no idea any of this. They said, we are so sorry but the attendance has gotten so bad that the giving has gotten really, really bad too. And we can no longer afford to pay you as we had promised. Now I'm five weeks into to burnout and not even close, not even close to being able to have the energy to take another job. And they said, this is your last check. And um, so Denise and I were left to process that that one evening after they left. And that was, that was January the 6th. Look on my schedule in January 7th, uh, breakfast with this pastor that I had set on November 5th was scheduled at Bob Evans. <laughs> so I meet with, with him for breakfast, and he says, <clears throat> so how are you doing? And, and uh, I did the, I did the, like the manly lying thing and said, I'm doing fine, doing really great, you know. <laughs> doing good, yeah, doing good. And he said, no, I, I think there's, wh wh how are you really doing? So I, I began to just tell him because he asked. And he said, just this morning in my prayer time, God told me that my church, that the church you, you know, pastor, he said, told me that my church, that there was going to come 
something really soon where they were going to have to step out on faith into a larger territory. They were going to have to step out on faith and put, he said, put their money where their mouth is. And he says, I know now that God was talking about you. And he says, I am going to go back to the leadership and we will pay the rest of your, of that five months now, the rest of the time to get you through that six months. And so by Thursday of that week, I get a check from a church I'd never attended, never was on staff, and clear up until six months, I got paid by another church. I lived off of another church um, that uh, God used to meet our needs. I can never forget going back and telling Denise, I think, you know, at her job, um, I'm not even sure how she made it through the rest of the day, but, you know, God, uh, God got up there on that ladder with me and through another church that stepped out and was willing for God to enlarge their territory, blessed me so that I could heal and bless Denise. Now, and it was no strings attached. He said, you don't have to come to church here. You don't have to pay us back. You No strings attached. We just want to help you. As it turned out, we visited other churches. And as it turned out, we ended up going there some weeks later and starting attending. And nobody knew who I was in relation to the churches helping me. Not a soul, except the leaders. So eventually, as I get more healed up, I start to lead some small groups, and I start to do some other things. I'm, they don't know me. They don't know any of this. And uh, it wasn't until after I moved here to Michigan then that I was able to take a Sunday off, and I went back, and I gave my testimony to this church. And I said, you don't know how you blessed a guy like me. And... They're like mouths were dropping, like, like we remember you. You were, and they have been paying me that whole time. So I move here, and um, Scott was at the first week I was here, or the second week that the 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 Millington. The first week. First week uh, I was here at this church. Um, the Ithaca football team was in playoffs with Millington. And um, as it ends up, a, a Millington football player's father died. And so um, Scott called me up. And God had laid this on his heart that uh, we should do something as a, as a church. Somebody other fans from the other church, but they could see him just being passionate. He never got to talk to the fans. And that was my heart was to reach out, just just to reach out to him. I had no idea what was going on. So God was working in this thing before you ever come. So this young man from Millington, uh, his father dies, and God lays on Scott's heart that, that we should do a tailgate um, party between the Ithaca fans and the Millington fans. Fans. Well, where I'm going with this is that the pastor who met with me on January 7th used to be a pastor in Millington in the Church of God, Mike Cottrell. And so then he moves to Indianapolis and is there when I am in need, and then I come here, and through what God did through us, enlarging our territory, 
we end up helping a family that he would have known uh, in that community in Millington. Enlarge my territory that your hand be with me. Bless me, O God. Bless me indeed so that I can be a blessing to others. And God, make my territory larger. And I know that when that happens, that I'm going to need your hand because it's going to be real scary on the high ladder. But you will meet me there. And you will lead me through that territory so that I can in turn be a blessing. Now, could we pray this for our church? Enlarge our territory, God, that your hand be with us. Bless us, God, as a church, and enlarge our territory of influence, for surely the founders of this church would be happy with where we're at, but they surely did not mean it to stop here. Bless us, God, and enlarge our territory because then our prayers will be more than just be with me when I go to the doctor and be with me when I take a road trip. But our, our prayers will be, God, be with me because if you're not with us in this large territory, we will fail. Enlarge our territory, God. So that we undoubtedly will want to pray and unmistakably know that your hand is with us. All the places to go in life, there's a place that God still wants you to go. You're not too old, you're not too fill in the blank, label it. Whatever label you believe, you're not that, you're not too because God sees you as his child and wants you to go through an open door that he wants to bless you through and then enlarge your territory so that you can go on and do more things in your life and to bless others. And as a church, there's more places for us to go and we'll do it together. To God's glory. Amen.